Richards channel, where you always learn a multitude of key concepts to improve your painting skills. Okay. Hey, hey. thanks for being here for paint class. Um, we're going to talk about some things today that if you don't have uh, notepads, I see some of y'all do, um, there's some paper and pens over there because I'm going to give you some gold today and it may be something you might want to write down and then go back and reflect on it later on try to use it in your paintings so um, it, it's going to be this stuff that's on this right here high tech so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, what when we are painting um, there are some things that are beneficial to us uh, when we're painting there's some things that we want to kind of get away from when we're painting and uh, one of those things is object-oriented painting. So this is the first little piece of gold. If you can get away from in your mindset, so we're talking about a paradigm shift here. Um, if you can get away from thinking, I'm going to paint a tree, I'm gonna paint a house, I'm gonna paint, you know, whatever it happens to be. And, and, and you see this from early on with people like, you know, uh, girls in high school will say, I can paint horses good, but I can't paint cars. The guys will say, I can paint cars, but I can't paint horses, you know. So they think they can paint a certain object. Well, they become familiar with something. And so they, they've observed it more than maybe they've observed something else. But what we want to do instead of thinking object-oriented painting is to think about how light um, hits whatever it happens to be. So now we stop thinking about it being an object and we start thinking about where am I seeing light? Where am I seeing color? Where am I seeing shadows? And, and the combination of light and shadows together actually creates form. So if you get caught up in a painting and you're doing all these details and you look at it and you go, that painting, it, it's so flat. You know, it seems so two-dimensional. Now, that's probably where the breakdown is, is you're thinking about an object instead of thinking about how light and shadow wrap around various different objects and create form. So that's what we want to move to, move away from object-oriented and move into thinking about light, shadow, color, edges, all of those kind of things that make up the concepts that are really important for painting. Um, point two, here, here's your other piece of gold. When you're painting a painting, don't think in terms of, I just want to paint this pretty painting, or I want to paint a painting that somebody they're going to look at and like that painting. Think in terms of where in the painting are we taking somebody. So there's a point of interest in your painting. This is gonna go a long way to, to making a painting where you know somebody walks by, there's a whole gallery of paintings and they see all these different paintings. You know, it's kind of like when you're window shopping. I used to have a, a, a drawing instructor in college that used to say, I, I, I like to go through a gallery like I'm window shopping. Like I, I just kind of walk along until something catches my interest, <clears throat> you know? And if you want your painting to be the one that it catches somebody's interest. It's not going to be because of the holistic painting. It's going to be because it draws you into it. So you, you, you have a point of interest that you're drawn to. And so if, if we realize that, that it's a point of interest that makes us go into the painting, become somehow involved in the painting, you know, emotionally involved in the painting, there are things that draw us in you know there's certain psychologies that have to do what what's going to catch our attention and some of those um, just kind of uh, technical elements that would draw a person into is uh, is contrasting elements so if there's a contrast somewhere in a certain area in your painting that is going to really draw you in um, for instance uh, a contrasting element, I put CE right here, contrasting elements, um, light to dark. So uh, let's look at this painting right here. Um, this light light uh, with a, a large section of dark dark 
is going to draw us into that thing. So we're at, this is actually kind of kind of read as light. You know, we don't have any paint that actually shines. You know, so the only thing we can do is make our darks actually darker than they actually are. And then the contrast, that's the key right there. See that contrasting element of light to dark is what is going to create the sense that there is light streaking through this forest. And so um, other things that um, we might look at as far as points of interest would be uh, creating something that's interesting as opposed to uninteresting. How many times have you seen like a landscape and, um, and everything in the landscape is perfectly in detail? Um, including, you know, the little clover grasses right at your feet as you're entering into the painting. But the problem with that, uh, having everything in detail is it, it just becomes a static field. It becomes something where we're not really paying attention to any particular thing. And, and everything just seems totally hard edged because it's totally in focus. So you want a transition? You want a transition. You want an area where it's less interesting so that you create an area that's very interesting. You can do that with hard edges. That's one of those contrasting elements is that you can have, uh, by and large, soft edges and then an area where you see very hard edges um, as a kind of a um, example. Uh, all of this forest floor in here. Now, this is not a finished painting. Uh, I want you to understand that. But you can see where it's going in this painting. So this forest floor being in shadow, um, there's not a lot of detail to anything. Um, whereas uh, these trees that are sticking up, they're very hard edge. We can see right where the edge of the trees begin, where they end. Some of this uh, uh, foliage that is sticking up into the light uh, may be a little harder edged than a lot of this that's over here where it's misty and kind of away from the light. So hard edges to soft edges is an important point. And then uh, the last of those is high chromatin and neutral. That's what we're going to focus on today is high chromatin and neutral. I'm going to make this kind of quick. Um, I just want to uh, show you. So um, high chromatin to neutral could be um, a, another way of putting that might be uh, intense colors to dull colors. So not only is this painting very dark to light in contrast, but it's very dull. Um, a lot of this, a whole lot of this painting is very dull colors. And then you see these really sharp, intense colors right here. So the high chroma colors have a tendency, and let me say this, dark to light, high chroma to neutral, you want no more than 20% of that to be light, no more than 20% of that to be high chroma if you're trying to create that extreme contrast like that. So you, you get this very dramatic lighting because um, you limit the amount of light. That way, the little bit of light that you see seems really light light compared to all this darkness. This chroma seems intense compared to all of this neutral. So, so Craig, are you saying, so of that painting, 20% of that painting should be high chroma? Uh, no, what I'm saying is, is at, at a maximum, 20%. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, the more you limit it, the more that it is a rose in the desert. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you combining the high chroma and the light? Would you say 20% or can you say 20%? Well, you you've know, got less these. Less than 20% high chroma plus less than 20% of bright lights. Yeah, light. you, you, you've lights. got different contrasting elements. So light to dark, um, just think of it as its own, <clears throat> excuse me, as its own thing. So uh, no more than 20%. Okay. Um, so you could limit that way down a lot more. And the impact of it as light is going to seem even more, uh, you know, to stand out even more. 
So, uh, but how much do you do that? You know, there there are um, paintings that you would refer to as low key. This would be a low key painting, low light for the most part. High key paintings where you know everything's in sunlight, and, and so there's a place for that. Um, but you you limit your ability <coughs> to create those contrasting elements, those points of interest, if you're not doing that. Okay. So yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to just add some paint onto the painting now. Um, when you're trying to create neutrals, um, the best thing that you can do is to mix um, colors that are opposites on the color wheel. Uh, we refer to those as complementary <coughs> colors. So uh, orange to blue is complements. Uh, let, let's think in terms of the primary colors. What would you add to a primary color in order to create a neutral? So, uh, so if we're talking about red, yellow, and blue, um, opposite of blue on the color wheel is orange. Opposite of yellow is going to be violet. Opposite of red is going to be green. So it's, it's your secondary colors that you're mixing to those. So um, let's, let's look at some of those. We've got uh, violet, and I want you to notice that even though this violet is a pretty dark color, I, I actually added some white to that because that's a dioxazine violet. Um, it comes very, very dark version. Um, it almost looks black when you apply it unless you add some white to it. Same thing for this um, French ultramarine blue. Um, straight out of the tube that is a much much darker color and then um, there's a nice lemon yellow so i was wanting to stick with the primary colors but i popped that purple up there you know what let me let me kind of just do this over again i like to do overs we used to have those when we were in elementary school, right? Yeah. No reason why we can't do it right now. Regroup. Regroup. Okay. Let's start over again. Let's just go primaries. So red. Look how high chroma that is. And when we say high chroma, we're not talking about warm to cool. That has nothing to do with chroma. This blue is a cool color, but look at how high chroma it is. It is not a dull blue. It is very intense. So red, yellow, and blue. Is that red uh, medium or uh, the light? Uh, that red light? is uh, that red is a straight cad red. Yeah. Um, what she's asking about is uh, there's various different versions of cad red. And um, if you have a CAD red light, I don't know why they really call it light because it's not really that it's light, it is shifting on the color wheel. So uh, here's a, a CAD red light. And if you look at that, what you'll notice is, is the CAD red light has a little bit of yellow in it. So it is heading towards the yellow on the color wheel. So it's getting what a little orange here so it might be what you know on the color wheel they'd refer to as red orange um, over here yellow orange you know so um, <clears throat> and that's a cad yellow right there um, interestingly wow. enough um, when you pull a cad yellow up let's put that next to this lemon yellow the cad yellow is a yellow orange that's that's all it is see it's it's got a little bit of red in it that's what's shifting it's shifting back towards the red in that case so um <clears throat> so we've got red yellow and blue here what will we mix with these in order to neutralize them um so for the uh yellow opposite on the color wheel is our violet
for our blue opposite on the color wheel is orange and green what's opposite on the color wheel uh, green red. already said it does. so red and green are opposites on the color wheel all right all of these are high chroma what you'll notice is is most colors straight out of the tube are not dull they have an intensity to them and so even if they're not something that you would ordinarily think of as high chroma color um it high chroma actually is high chroma compared to what what are you comparing it to what's it up against you know um, but if you want to make these neutralized you're going to add a little bit of the opposite on the color wheel so for red to green um, if we had some red here and we kind of spread that red out and we had some green here we kind of brought the green back towards the red where the red and green meet together so that there's just a little bit of red do you see how it neutralized out it's not that it's getting lighter or darker it's that it is losing its chroma so even though if I were to see this color right here all by itself I would say that's green you know, somebody asked, you know, what I asked, oh, what color is that? That's that green. But this is a very neutralized version of that same green. Now, if it's here where the green and the red kind of mix together in more equal uh, quantities, almost kind of like a brownish color right there but let's add some white to it and see what happens I'm just gonna lighten it up a little bit so that we can see it a little lighter and that is kind of a grayish color very neutralized anyway and then if we added a little bit of green to the red so just a tad of green to some of this red what happens the red remains red but it gets dull so it's no longer high chroma and of course all of that is where it just depends on how much of it that you're talking about so we got high chroma red high chroma green green that's been neutralized red that's been neutralized and then totally neutralized where it is going into the gray range let's look at the blue and the orange the same way So I'm spreading that orange back towards the blue. I'm spreading the blue towards the orange. And over here where the orange is, where I just add a little bit of blue to it, it stays orange. But look how neutralized it is. Over here, where the blue is, let's get a little more paint on there running out of paint trying to do that it's blue but I added just a touch of orange see how neutralized that blue got all of a sudden so we can do that with all of these yellow and purple do the same thing but you end up with a little bit more of a brownish gray so that's that is uh, what we would refer to as a warm gray um, whereas with um, the green and red you get a, a warm gray 
but if you do the blue and the orange, particularly if you add a little more blue, then you have orange. I don't know if you can tell it dark there. Look how dark and dull that is. But if I add a little bit of white to it so that we can see it a little more clearly, look how much of a flat gray that is. Just as gray as it can get. Right. So when you uh, mix these color complements equally, you end up with grays. Depending on how much of the warmer color that you use in your mixture, it'll get a warm gray. The more cool color you use, the cooler gray it's going to get. So you know, with the blue, you add a little more blue. Um, let, let's just do that. Let's add a little more blue to that gray. And I'm going to add some white to that so you can see it a little better. So we've got a gray there. But look how bluish that gray is. So it's nice and cool. Let's do the same thing the other direction. Let's add a little bit more, just a tad more blue to that orangey mix there. But we're going to mainly stick with the orangey. And we're making a gray. It's kind of dark right now. I'm going to add some white to it. And watch what happens to it. It's a gray also, but look how much warmer that gray is. Cool gray, solid gray, warm gray. It just depends on how much of that color complement you use. And then, of course, white will lighten it or you can have it really dark and dull. So um, there you go, high chroma to neutral. Why would you use that? Point of interest, trying to get somebody to go to a certain place in your painting. And because of that, using that high chroma with the dull, using the light with the dark, using the hard edges with all of the softness, draws your eye into one spot into the painting. And again, the more you limit that, the more they're gonna to go to that one spot and nowhere else. So, okay, that's it. So we'll do some painting. You can apply this concept to anything you're doing. So uh, there are some, uh, some references, some photo references over on the counter over there that you're welcome to use to do a painting. If you have something you're working on your own self, of course, um, you can do that as well. Okay. Hey, oh, any questions before we uh, go to paint? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. How are you going to fix that painting? Yeah, you're just gonna scrape it off, or oh, I'm gonna wipe it off. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I'll do that because. Okay. Hey there! I hope you enjoyed that video, and I hope you're getting a lot of value out of all of these videos that we're posting on the artist Craig Richards channel. Um, you know, there's all kinds of how tos. There's the weekly paint class. Uh, and there's occasional outings, like uh, going out in plain air somewhere. We're going to be going down the Yadkin River in the spring, uh, going to museums, things like that. I think you'd enjoy those. Um, if you're getting value out of these, then uh, do the, uh, like, subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell. Uh, you have to subscribe in order to be able to hit the notification bell, and that's for you. Um, the reason I'm saying that is so that uh, you know when the next paint class is coming out, so that if you're working on a painting and we're doing it again the next week, that you can follow along with us. And leave us comments, you know, not just for me, but for the students as well. Say, you know, Deb, you did a great painting, Kitty, you did a great painting, or Craig, you did a great demonstration demonstration this week. Um, that builds us up and we want to build you up as well. We want to help you to keep painting and keep growing. You're doing great. Uh, don't tell yourself you're not. Um, you are doing wonderful. Just keep at it and you'll learn and grow each week with us. 
So happy painting. Okay.